we gather in praise of a God who is supremely worthy to be praised. We come at His bidding, not because we are uniquely qualified to do so, but because He is uniquely qualified to call us. In worship, we are reminded continuously of His grace and goodness, and we're moved to thank God because of His kindness toward us. It is our privilege to join together in gratitude to the one who has given us life and love. Therefore, let us with confidence worship God. The first reading is taken from the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4, and the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 5. These are words of advice from a father to his son. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare will they give you. Let not loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them upon your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So will you find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Get wisdom. Get insight. Amen.
Let us pray. Having come through another highly and closely contested election, O God, we ask for thy guidance in leading all of us through the next four years. Grant to the American populace a spirit of equanimity, and especially to the President and members of Congress, a willingness to compromise for the many necessary decisions which face us. We pray that all the individuals who may have been elected may not perceive their election to be an individual mandate, but that instead they have been elected collectively to work together with everyone in Congress to seek a mandate for the best and wisest choices facing our people. We pray also for the candidates who lost their election, asking that thou wouldst inspire them in ways for other pursuits, and that the experience of political loss will not be for them a great personal loss. We pray for family members everywhere who are faced with major decisions which must be made or discussions which must be faced, and there is little or no agreement as a starting place for those discussions. Grant equanimity of spirit to those who find it very difficult to broach subjects they know will cause disagreements, but which must be addressed nonetheless. Help us in the relationships of blood or marriage to be as open and honest as we can be with those with whom we have established relationships of choice. May all who love us the most and whom we love the most be as candid as we are with those with whom we have evolved close mutual friendships. We ask thy forgiveness for all the things we have done to wrong those around us and for the selfishness of both our thoughts and our actions. We pray for anyone we have hurt through our behavior. We remember also those who recently have suffered major setbacks in life through the death of a loved one, the onslaught of an illness, anxieties caused by certain relatives or friends being in harm's way, psychological dips prompted for no discernible reason but which take their toll anyway, and for battles with a relentless and utterly apathetic virus. Uphold all of us in all our needs, O Thou who art a loving and grace-filled God. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, now praying together as he taught his followers, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The second reading is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 49 through 53. These are words which Jesus spoke to his disciples, saying what likely was going to be the result of their following him with respect to others who would not do that. I came to cast fire upon the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For henceforth in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. 
They will be divided father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against her mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. May the Lord bless to us these readings from His Holy Word, and to His name be the glory and the praise. Amen. The text for the sermon is taken from Luke's Gospel, the 12th chapter, verses 51 and 52, where Jesus said, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For henceforth, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. The theme for the sermon is speaking truth to relatives. Sometimes it's harder to get down to brass tacks, as we say, with relatives than it is with anyone else. Saying what we really think or expressing how we real, really feel can be much more difficult with an adult child or grandchild or sister or brother or nephew or niece or cousin than with a best friend, a neighbor, or a mere acquaintance. We acquire friends and neighbors as we go along through life, but we have our relatives from the day we are born, and somehow that puts them into a different category when we really want to talk about the most important things facing us or them. Take the 2020 election, for example. Probably most Americans could talk freely with every relative they have because they all agreed on matters political. But there are other people who were faced with a much different situation. There they could not talk to a single relative about what they thought about the upcoming election. For them, it was, as Jesus said in Matthew 10 and Luke 12, they will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. I have two children. With one of them, I was in complete sync with everything to do about this election. With the other, we started to talk about what was going on, and then it became more heated, and then we decided for months we would not talk about that at all. I could not talk with my relatives in Wisconsin, any of them, about this election, but I could talk with all of my Kansas relatives because we were on the same page. When it was over, I could rejoice with my Kansas relatives about what happened in Wisconsin, but we all were in mourning about what happened in Kansas. What do those closest to us think about the Affordable Care Act, or immigration policy, or the latest three members of the Supreme Court? But quite apart from things like that, what do our closest relatives think about how dad and mom raised us, 
or the way that we tried to raise our own children, or the way that our children tried to raise their children. Did we give full approval to the person our daughter or son chose to marry? Or did we express what we thought were some necessarily strong words of caution? And if they went ahead and got married anyway, how did it turn out? The book of Proverbs consists of 31 chapters of advice about almost everything in Under the Sun. The opening verse of the first chapter says that it was the book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon. Almost certainly that is not true. Solomon may have contributed a little to the book, but surely it is a compendium of advice given through many centuries by Israelites to Israelites. In that male-dominated society, a father in the book of Proverbs offers many suggestions to his son. But he never says one peep to his daughter. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Let not your loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me. And he said to me, let your heart hold fast to my words. Do not forget. Do not turn away. Get wisdom. Get insight. All of us were born at least two centuries too late to get advice like that from anyone in the older generation. Both they and we were too busy with life to say or hear anything like that. Furthermore, very few of us grew up with an extended family, all our relatives living to together in one place. It was probably more harmonious then than now because they all knew they were stuck with one another and they were going to live with these people for the rest of their lives. So they did their best to get along. But few of us ever had every relative in one place and all of us eventually moved away from wherever it was we were born and grew up. Now, Almost everyone in most families is probably scattered to the four winds. In addition, even if everyone in every family all lived in the same community, it is much less likely to occur that the younger generations follow the advice of the older generations. As younger generations became more educated in certain particulars, especially in matters technological, respect for elders diminished. We likely respected our elders less than our grandparents respected their elders, and they likely respected their elders less than their grandparents ex ex respected theirs. This is a widespread tendency of the past couple of centuries. In addition, few older whites who live on Hilton Head Island have children or grandchildren who also live on the island. Therefore, the younger generations don't see the older generation nearly as much as when they all live together somewhere on the actual continent of North America. 
In the contemporary USA, if younger people now disagree with their parents, wherever they live, they are more apt to express it. I'm not saying that this is good or bad, although depending on what the older generation says, it could be either good or bad. But I am saying that acquiescence to the purported wisdom of older people is diminishing in contemporary American society. Democracy itself may be part of the reason for that. It also may have weakened the fifth commandment, the one which says, honor your father and your mother. Some variety of monarchy was almost always the universal form of government until the end of the 18th century. But with the evolution of democracy in many nations since then, citizens were urged to think for themselves. Under those circumstances, they did not necessarily agree with their elders on the most important issues in their lives. If you're old and you're feeling that your views are not being granted the value you think they should be given by your children, you may need to get used to it. But disagreements need not automatically become disagreeable. Speaking truth to relatives need not be painful if there is high regard for one another regardless of the issues over which we might disagree. Disagreements should not be perceived in terms of victory or defeat, but rather in terms of an honest sharing of thoughts and feelings. However, generational differences may have become a surprise to some of us. Fifty or seventy-five years ago, if the older generation became upset with the younger generation, it usually was because the younger generation were becoming too liberal in their religious thinking or in their politics for the older generation. Now, it may be the reverse. The young or middle-aged adult children may become too conservative for some 70, 80, or 90-year-old parents. When anyone becomes, who anyone becomes may be determined by when or where they happen to have been born or where they grew up as young adults rather than who their parents were. And that may be a hard adjustment for parents to make. What all of this is leading to is that intergenerational relationships are much more complex now than they were in biblical times. Individual geographical mobility hardly existed two or three thousand years ago. Nearly everyone permanently stayed where they were born. Because extended families lived in close proximity to one another, they all conversed with one another on a daily basis. Few of us ever did that as adults. In fact, many people today have completely lost track of relatives. That's especially likely to happen if relatives move to places with names like London or Singapore. In two passages in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus indicated that his ministry would create problems for many people. It would make it hard for them to speak to one another as they perceived what was true. In Matthew, Jesus opened this hard saying with these words, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come not to bring peace, 
but a sword. Of course, he was speaking figuratively and not literally. In Luke, the opening words of the essence of this passage are as follows. I came to cast fire upon the earth, and would that it were already kindled. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? Jesus asked. No, I tell you, but rather divisions. Then Jesus launched into his saying about how various family members would become divided because of him. Over the past 2,000 years, sadly, that surely happened in millions of families. Despite what both these passages seem to imply, Jesus did not intend family animosity to arise because of him. Instead, he was saying inevitably that that animosity was bound to occur. Until Christianity became widespread in innumerable communities and nations, many families, no doubt, were torn apart because of the tension between paganism and this new religion. For dozens of generations, however, it was probably the younger generation who were accepting the new religion, and the older generation wanted to stay with the old religion. Now I want to address an issue which is becoming more and more prevalent for families than ever before, and it will be increase, it will be affecting increasing numbers of people in this congregation. It's obvious to everyone who is even tangentially aware of what's going on in the world that people are living longer. That readily prompts many occasions which necessitate speaking truth by and to relatives which did not occur with such frequency in years gone by. More than half of us in this congregation live in retirement homes. If we've lived there for even two or three years, we have been in a position closely to observe the slow or rapid physical or mental decline of some of our new neighbors. We're aware that the children of some of these folks want their parents either to move to an assisted living facility or a nursing home here on the island or to a facility in the community in which they, the children, live. And we have seen many of these people resist or refuse to do what the children think they should do. Here is a sobering chronological issue. Many, but by no means all, elderly people are afflicted with impaired thinking as they get older. At present, there are no medical procedures to prevent this process, and there may never be. Furthermore, many old people become quite impaired physically as well. During the racial unrest this year, which erupted when police killed or injured several blacks across our country, those of us who are white heard an expression we had never heard before. It is the conversation which virtually all black parents have with their teenage children, and it is called the talk. In the talk, black parents tell their children that if they're ever stopped by police when they are driving, they must keep their hands on the top of the steering wheel. And if they're asked to step out of the car, they must do so with open hands 
that the police can readily see. If they're stopped by the police when they are pedestrians, the parents tell their children they must act respectfully to the police, they must not talk back, and they must do everything they are told to do. And why is it that black parents give their children the talk? It is because they know that blacks are not treated equally by the police as they treat whites. To avoid that, the parents are saying, the children must acquiesce. It is a result of what we so quaintly and so cynically call the peculiar institution. Some of your children at some point may feel compelled to engage in a different kind of talk with you. If so, it'll be a major generational role reversal. Because they love you and respect you, they the younger ones will be giving you what they believe is the best advice they can offer you. Mom or dad, they may say, we think the time has come for you to give up driving. Or we think it is time for you to move out of the house and into a retirement home. Or we think you should move out of the retirement home into an assisted living facility or a nursing home. Speaking truth to relatives doesn't get any harder for your children to initiate that conversation, that talk with you. And if you think perhaps you need to have the talk and they have not raised it with you because they lack courage to do so, then you may have to raise it to see what they are thinking about how you're doing. An old song lyric says, we only hurt the ones we love. Such conversations are never intended to hurt. They are only intended to help but when we have the talk with our children, we are the only ones who can determine whether it ends up hurting or helping us. No one in the younger or older generation wants to have a talk like that, but for many older people, the time may come when that kind of decision or discussion must occur. The folk aphorism of the past 50 years is so true. Old age really is not for sissies. For when old age has seized us in its implacable grip, we must come to that, face that reality and take whatever advice that we may strongly have, had, have resisted for so long. Otherwise, it may be Father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. In such circumstances, everyone is striving to do what is right and what is best, but there may be powerful disagreement on precisely what that is. In the first congregation I served over 50 years ago, in my first week or two, I met a wonderful old man. I went to visit him because he kind of captivated me. He told me that when he was a child, both of his parents had died by the time he was 10 years old. I was very sad to hear that. So I asked him, well, then, 
Who raised you? He said, Nobody. I just growed up. And he just growed up to be a wonderful human being. What he did to raise himself, I don't know, but he did a wonderful job of it. He's one of the finest people I have ever known in over 50 years of pastoral ministry. Thank heaven that most of us grew up with parents and brothers and sisters and to one extent or another with grandparents or aunts or uncles or cousins. It wasn't always easy and we didn't always agree with one another, but they were there. And we talked and laughed and cried and agreed and disagreed. Then most of us chose our own wives or husband. And we had children and grandchildren and we spoke truth to one another as wisely and as civilly as we could. Wasn't always easy. And it isn't always easy, but we did it and we do it because it must be done. Now, some of us may be entering a new chapter in our lives. And how are we doing with everyone in our family now? Are we speaking truth to relatives? Or whenever we see them or talk to them, do we just casually pass the time of day? Amen. Now may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may the Lord hold you in the hollow of his hand. Amen. Amen.